Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar, The Case for Quality Provider Data Across the Healthcare Enterprise. Before we begin with the actual presentation, we wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen are multiple application widgets that you can use. These are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop experience. You can expand your slide area or maximize it to full screen by clicking on the arrows in the top right corner. If you have any questions during the webcast, please submit them through the Q&A widget. We will try to answer each of these throughout the webcast, but if a fuller answer is needed or if we run out of time, it will be answered later via email. For the best viewing experience, we recommend using a wired internet connection and closing any programs or browser sessions running in the background that could cause issues. Webinars are bandwidth intensive, so closing any unnecessary browser tabs will help conserve your bandwidth. We are streaming this through your computer, so there is no dial-in number. For the best audio quality, please make sure your computer speakers or headset are turned up and the volume is up so you can hear the presenters. Some networks cause the slides to advance more slowly than others, so logging off via VPN is recommended. If your slides are behind, please push F5 on your keyboard to refresh the screen. An on-demand version of this webcast will be available and sent to your inbox approximately 24 hours after this live event. Please be on the lookout for that. Now I would like to introduce today's speakers, Makisha Cropper and Sarah Cuzo. Makisha serves as LexisNexis Director of Market Planning. Her focus is on the development and execution of strategic planning for the company's provider data intelligence suite of products. Makisha's 20 plus years, 20 plus year career has included product strategy, product management, and analytic roles where she has developed and supported products at various stages of maturity, touching healthcare professionals, patients, payers, and life science customers. She holds a BS in Information Management Systems and an MS in Information Technology from Wilmington University. She also holds multiple certifications, including project management, project management, scrum master, and product owner. Sarah has been a leader and for the provider directories team at Centene Corporation for over two years, starting as a manager and now as director. Her team works to ensure the accuracy of print and online directories for all Centene products and markets. They also lead innovation and the functionality and compliance with display of the tools themselves. Before that, she led the Centi New Hampshire Health Plan Data Quality Team for three years. Sarah has received a BA in Healthcare Administration from Stonehill College. She's been in the healthcare industry since graduation, working for local payers in the New England area in both commercial and Medicaid space, as well as national payer. She held roles from provider relations to contracting and is well acquainted with the provider life cycle that ends in directory display. Thank you both for joining us today. Makisha, I'll turn the presentation over to you. Thank you so much, and thank you all for joining. Provider data is the foundation of our healthcare system. The administrative provider data is essential to keeping the country's $3 trillion healthcare system going, from paying bills to improving patient care. Despite that, inefficient, fragmented, and uncoordinated processes to managing this information contribute to waste. This provider information is needed at different times and for different reasons throughout the healthcare segments from compliance checks to credentialing, referral management, provider directory maintenance, revenue cycle management, marketing, business development, provider relations, recruiting, directory maintenance, claims administration, and hospital privileges needed. This provider data is changing all the time. 2.4% of provider demographics change each month. 20% of the doctors change their affiliations each year, and 5% of doctors change their statuses each year. Provider demographic data quality degrades rapidly. The bar chart represented here is representing a time span of 18 months, 
where in the first month, provider data quality is almost at 100%, and by month 18, it's degraded to almost 50%. The pace of business leads to additional inaccuracies. You have human errors in data entry, multi-method delivery of incoming transactions, and updates with errors and omissions. You also have data integration challenges across data sources, organizational silos, and mergers. So how much does this data really change in a week? Within a week, you have 33,000 primary address changes, 3,300 name changes, 1,750 phone number changes, and 1,500 fax number changes. How do you keep your provider data up to date? Within the same week, you also have 104,000 state license and expiration status changes, 1,000 DEA numbers, 7,000 state license qualifiers, and 300 thanks sanctioned and deceased changes. So how do you know if your provider practice status is still good? In the time we spent on this slide, your provider data has aged and become out of date. And these are national numbers. Your market uh, as a percentage may be even worse. We'd like to take this time to ask you guys a question. And if you guys could take the opportunity or take the time to respond to this question, we'd greatly appreciate it. What we'd like to know is what types of solutions do you currently rely on for improved provider data quality? Do you rely on outreach from internal teams, outsourced provider outreach, third-party data solutions, or other solutions? We'll give you guys some time to, uh, to answer the question before we move on to taking a look at the results. Thank you guys so much. So it looks like most of you guys are relying on outreach from internal teams. With that, we understand the process to maintain this information is complex and costly. Those costs are related to establishing and maintaining a provider information file or file. You have costs related to IT, and that includes finding and updating data sources, loading source files, developing and maintaining matching algorithms, developing and or licensing software for standardization, parsing, et cetera. And then you also have the storage and hardware costs. You, then you have the cost of ongoing integration of the data into your systems, including verification and dupl of duplicates and potential changes and the associated downstream processes associated with those changes. Then there are the labor costs for additions of and corrections to provider records, including verification costs, and the costs to support claims and customer service issues. In addition, there are ongoing costs associated with responding to changes in regulations and compliance. Other costs include labor costs to support claims fallout, and customer service. And then you have the project costs associated with data quality and those ongoing costs of preparing your directory files. The integrity of this provider data feeding our systems, decisions, and strategies continues to be flawed. You get unintended errors from phone verification. You have roster accuracy issues. You have problems with the testing cell phone as the appointment phone, and then the number of locations and distance. Can you really have 75 or a provider at 75 locations? And can a provider really work for the same group and be at two offices 200 miles apart? Not likely. And this ultimately prevents patients from getting the care they need. 
In Maryland, less than half of the psychiatrists listed in directories could be reached at the number provided. 19% were not actually psychiatrists, but a different type of physician. And only 8% could see new patients within the 45-day window needed. In New Jersey, contact information for one-third of psychiatrists listed in the directories was wrong. And then in California, 18.2% of the doctors in their directory were not practicing at the listed location. And 8.8% of doctors did not accept plans marketplace insurance. Noncompliance can be costly. The inaccuracies in the Medicare Advantage directories may trigger penalties of up to $25,000 per day per beneficiary or bans on new enrollment and marketing. The federal exchange plans could face penalties of up to $100 per day per beneficiary for problems in their directories. Yet compliance still comes with challenges. You have issues with delegated groups and large groups. You have multiple groups and locations per provider, and you have provider responsiveness, participation, and abrasion being a problem. We've made great progress, but there's still a lot more to do. In 2016, CMS put forth an effort to address directory accuracy. They did so by looking by doing directory uh, audits. Essentially, in the three-year time span, they did three audits, and what they found is that the average accuracy for the industry was 55%. The number one issue was the practitioner not being at the location or not even with the group. Today, we continue to make forward progress. We have a better understanding of how we can address these issues, but we still have recurring errors. And a lot of this will, a lot of what it will take for us to help solve these issues will be more collaboration from the providers, from the payers, and from the members. The high cost of achieving optimized provider data quality supports the need for more collaboration, but there is no silver bullet. From a stakeholder perspective, providers need a better method to reduce their burden and need to be pulled into the accountability equation. And then from the payer perspective, they need a single source to begin with and then align internal processes to support these, but there also needs to be more accountability. At this point, we would like to understand which of these methods you guys have used. If you could take the time to answer our question, we'd greatly appreciate it. So again, of these methods, we'd like to know if you've used provider outreach, i.e. fax phone, if you're utilizing traditional rosters, if you're using some new technology, whether it be blockchain or automatic or automated intelligence, or if you're repurposing existing workflows or portals. You guys could take the time to answer that question. We'd greatly appreciate it. All right, we'll move on to our results. It looks like provider outreach by uh, either phone or fax is the majority, uh, is what you guys, the majority of you guys are using. And now we'll look into each one of these traditional methods. The first one that we're looking at is calling providers only. We provided an example here of the top 20 payers. What we looked at is that overall they had about 300,000 active practitioner or practice locations and then four contacts or confirmations annually. That came out to 1.2 million contacts per year and 17 minutes per contact or confirmation with a grand total of 20.4 million minutes per year. And if you multiply that by eight hours, I'm sorry, $8 per hour, which is minimum wage, 
you get an annual cost of $2.72 million. And then if you multiply that by the top 20 payers, that's $54.4 million in annual cost. And you're still getting a response rate of about 40 to 80 percent. And of the providers not at location responses, 8 percent of them have conflicting subsequent response saying provider is practicing at the location. 15 percent of them have subsequent claims activities indicating that the provider is practicing at the location. And on the other side of the provider at location responses, you had 6.5 percent of them having conflicting reports of deceased, retired, or inactive license in the practice state, and then 6% show last claim activity over 18 months ago. The next traditional method that we'll take a look at is dependency on rosters only. Group rosters, while correct, generally in terms of affiliated providers and practice locations, do not include the level of precision required for directories. A May 2019 analysis based on a roster supplied to LN in uh, April of 2019, we looked at, excuse me, uh, there were, we compared, they were compared against claims activity. The provider locations with no claims activity in 18 months were flagged as potential drops. Provider service locations with claims with over five claims in the last six months were flagged as potential ads to directory. Other provider locations with over five claims in the last six months were flagged as potential ads for claims only. So again, we have 10% of the response of the, we suggested that 10% were actually correct and 34% were actually uh, needed to be investigated. The third silver bullet that we're going to uh, look at is the blockchain uh, method. We actually participated in a small pilot uh, with the Synaptic Alliance for the blockchain method. When we provided this information uh, to for the health, for reviewing the uh, health plan only data uh, into the blockchain, we did see that uh, there were there was a, an accuracy rate of around 67 to 88 percent. But what that wasn't considering was the uh, impact. It was looking at accuracy, but not impact. So it wasn't until you got to the 11 customer, 11 plus customers, where you were able to cross the threshold of 90% accuracy and the volume or impact of a record of the record that overlap at that level is, is pretty small. In the LexisNexis uh, consortium of payer data, we had, we use a different approach and this approach is essentially looking at all of the referential data sources, which we probably have about 3,000 plus. That includes attestations, claims analytics of about 1.6 billion, and a lot of the other data that's available in our provider data repository. So essentially, we took this data and we overlapped it to show how that synaptic alliance could gain access to over 1.3 million inactive locations, which were over 90% confidence of being inactive. And then the 3.5 million active locations where they were over 90% confident were being, of being active. And this essentially represents a before and after picture. So the blockchain before without LexisNexis involvement and the blockchain after with LexisNexis involvement. So one of the things that we are moving toward is taking a uh, removing the redundancy and detangling the web by taking a multifaceted approach. With our move to a provider data exchange hub, we detangle the web and we remove the redundancy and we're able to derive conclusions based on facts through AI and machine learning and this and remove the information lag time. We're talking about streamlining the data exchange 
by removing all of the point-to-point -point interactions and enabling updated information to be published to the hub and then be received from the hub. What we mean is we're taking a look at all of the layers of information that are included in the healthcare spectrum. So we're looking at referential data, remediation data, medical claims, prescription claims, and all this does is it essentially allows us to build upon our provider data quality. We start with a baseline here of 60%, and when we add on these different layers, again, being referential data, outreach remediation, claims monitoring, rosters, contributory data, and portals, we get to an accuracy uh, level of between 85 and 95%. One of the ways in which we do this is we have our provider data continuum. This continuum of provider data assets and management, visualization, analytics, and services that allows customers to optimize data insight. We start with our first layer, which is our provider data master file. This is our industry-leading provider referential database covering more than 8.5 million U.S. healthcare practitioners and 1 million organizations, including their relationships across IDNs, ACOs, payers, and healthcare systems. Then we layer on top of that provider point, which is our provider data cleansing and enhancement services, including verification, correction, and augmentation. And then we have our real time, our Verify HCP product, which is our real time access to comprehensive provider information through search criteria, API, and provider perform verification. We'll take a look at the provider directory risk stratification example, where we have our roster uh, here. We take that information and we put it through our provider, uh, our provider data master file, and we layer that with the LexisNexis claims data, which is our provider point solution. What we get is a risk analysis where we're essentially providing insight into what information would we recommend being removed from the directory, and then what information needs further examination, and that could be uh, examined with your claims data, with the payer's claims data, and then we also provide information on the ones that we think are pretty accurate. The provider point solution can be standalone. It can be used as a pre-campaign uh, tool to determine the outreach population. It could also be used as a post-campaign uh, to determine which non-responders to term or suppress. And then you could also use it on non-campaign populations to determine what to terminate or suppress. And then with the Verify HCP, it can be used for immediate removal of inactive locations. It could also be used to address non-outreach and non-responder populations. Because it's a bit hard to visualize, uh, we'll use this illustration based on a real group. So here's an example of a large group. The, services, the service locations are listed across the top. The providers are listed alongside, along the left side. Everywhere the provider is listed at location is noted as a green box. Effectively, every provider has been listed at every location, which a few rare exceptions are shown as white boxes. Obviously, this can't be right for a directory. For a given provider to be seeing patients at 39.5 locations, they would have to be going to two locations per day, every day, and only going back to each location once per month. Now, here's the same group with analytics using claims and other data points applied to it. Of the 2,052 directory listings, 188 really are appropriate for directory purposes. And these are at the locations where the providers actually have seen patients in the, eight, in the last 18 months. 
In this example, two providers left the group altogether. But because they could provide coverage, they are still valid for claims processing. And we've seen, we've been sending the, the results of this analysis to our payers that are our customers to tell them which providers to terminate, they're the red ones, which provider locations to publish in your directory, the green ones, and which ones to use to support claims processing, the green and yellow. So the insights that we're delivering are which providers are no longer practicing anywhere? Are they no longer licensed in this state? Are they no longer practicing at this location? Are they no longer practicing with this group? Are they still licensed? Have they recently confirmed, have they been recently confirmed and are still practicing at the location? recently confirmed as still practicing with this group? Or have, do they have practice restrictive sanctions? We have our next poll question that we'd like you guys to answer for us. If you could help us by telling us in your business, where do you focus the most attention on provider data quality? Do you focus on provider at location? provider license, provider sanctions, is the provider no longer with the group, or other? You guys could take a moment and answer those questions. Answer this question, we greatly appreciate it. Thank you all so much. It looks like the majority is focusing on provider at location. All right, at this time, I am going to turn it over to Sarah, who is going to provide some real world examples of how they are utilizing LexisNexis's services to assist with their provider accuracy, provider directory accuracy. Great, thank you so much, Makisha. Give the give us over here. Waiting for the systems to catch up. <laughs> so, um, as uh, Shannon introduced at the beginning, I come from the Centene Corporation. I'm the director of the provider directories team. So we are focused on. Um, both the functionality and the accuracy of our online and print directories. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we've utilized LexisNexis in those efforts, specifically around the accuracy portion um, over the years and, and where we're looking to go to as we look forward. So our little bit of uh, history that we've had with ProviderPoint, uh, sorry, with LexisNexis started with ProviderPoint in the fall of 2015. Um, and as Makisha did touch on provider point returns that accuracy score based on the LexisNexis risk solutions master provider database. Uh, those results are returned. Uh, I know she went over three categories, but with the team we've <laughs> we've added a fourth one in there uh, to give us some insight into um, coverage location errors. So we have critical, medium, low, and no risk. Um, so those uh, critical risks are removed from the directory as soon as we get that file back. We suppress those. Again, that still allows for claims payment. Any critical risks have declined each time we run provider point. Um, so it's showing that um, you know, we're, we're making an impact and keeping that data down. As we learn more, we kind of trigger other things in our systems to continue to keep those critical risks at bay. Uh, our primary focus with provider point is our delegated providers. Uh, for those of you who come from payers know it's difficult to get delegated providers engaged on the phone or in other outreaches. So we really rely on provider point to help us cleanse that data, especially on those delegates. Uh, we do include our non-delegates as well, but it's our only touch point for our delegates right now. Those medium risks, again, I touched on are, are coverage location errors. Uh, so this is, as Makisha showed in her 
example about how a roster would tend to come in with here are 20 locations for my group and here are 20 practitioners and we're going to put all 20 practitioners at all 20 locations. So that medium risk category is meant to address those so we can take action on those. And we do include um, folks who would be looking at network adequacy because sometimes those numbers can be um, so high as we talked about, you know, we choose an example of 20, but, you know, we've seen as high as 60, 70 locations for a practitioner. So chances are if we're taking that down to a more reasonable number of where they're actually practicing, we're going to have an impact on network adequacy. So we have to be cognizant of that, but then it's the battle of um, if you're building your adequacy on the back of inaccurate data, you really aren't adequate. Also have worked with their VHCP product, uh, Verify Healthcare Practitioner. We completed our first campaign in February of 2017. Um, VHCP engages directly with providers, uh, fax, phone, email, portal. So practitioners are basically reviewing the data, which is the Centene data that we send over to LexisNexis, and that returns an attested response. Uh, so, you know, some providers who were used to doing this used to go into the portal, just make their, any changes that they have and are done. If they'd rather, uh, there are folks at LexisNexis who will reach out. Uh, via fax and phone, or we'll send emails of a roster to them that they can make edits to, whatever they find to be the easiest way for them to work with it. Usually varies based on the size of the group and number of practitioners. And then um, health plans manually review, when we get those files back from LexisNexis, we share those with our health plans. About 50% of those fields we're able to auto-update. As soon as we get them back, they're more black and white type categories, like phone numbers. Um, and then about 50% of the fields we want the health plans to put a little bit of research and, um, and time into maybe things that they need to verify other sources before they make a change, and then those are um, sent off to be updated in our source system as well. And again, our primary focus here is on non-delegated providers, um, because as of yet, uh, delegated providers have been very difficult to engage in an outreach campaign. So we continue to improve the process. As you see, we've had a good number of years of history working with them. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're always looking for continuous improvement opportunities. One opportunity has been in the false positive space, um, you know, especially for those folks who are newer um, and there's a lot of changes coming through on their data. They may be hesitant to think, could all of this possibly be right? Um, so we uh, have always had that feedback loop with LexisNexis and, and myself and my team. Um, but we have now opened up that tool to have direct access to all of our health plans. So anyone at a health plan that feels that the data that they're getting back is not accurate can submit that as a false positive. Um, to date, those counts have remained very low. Um, we're working on getting that first set of reporting out to just show, you know, the, the amount, even though they're low that are being submitted, how few are actually held up to be false positives. There'll always, unfortunately, be the issue of, you know, you call an office today, ask a question, get that information, I'll call them tomorrow. I could speak to the same person and I'll get different information. So we're always going to have that struggle. Um, but overall, we have not found that uh, the data that's coming back has been inaccurate. It could be a matter of timing or just a different person or, you know, slightly phrased different question. So we're always working to maintain that anything we do for an outreach, as well as what LexisNexis does, are in sync and asking the same questions in the same way to try to elicit the same answers. Another big key for us is working on increasing response rates for the VHCP, the outreach product. Um, Non-responders, uh, we've worked on really improving that number by generating letters uh, based on reporting from LexisNexis. Uh, so we get a list of who's um, a, a non-responder for the current campaign, or this campaign and the last campaign, and then has never responded to a campaign. We treat those a little bit differently. We send them out in waves. Um, but we really have found that we've gotten a pretty good lift from those letters um, in the hopes that that's getting in the hands of the right person versus maybe some of the outreaches we were, we were hitting the wrong person or just they hadn't had a chance to do it yet. And hopefully that, that letter helps to um, elicit that response. Also key to procure contacts. Um, so we rely on our, on our health plans for that a lot because we at a, uh, in the corporate team don't necessarily know those providers well enough to know who we should be reaching out to to feed that data to LexisNexis. Obviously, having a person in a direct dial or a direct email is the best way to get to that attestation. So we 
rely on our partner health plans to make sure they're keeping that, us up to date with any changes there and supplying that over so that LexNexus can make a successful contact. For delegates in large groups, we're working on a roster ingestion project. Um, and this is a way we, we were looking to bring delegates into the outreach product is by the ability, most of the times those delegates have rosters. They're not necessarily in a format that we can consume. They're not necessarily having all the fields in the right order that we can easily pull them in and, and ingest those. Um, so what we're partnering with LexisNexis on is being able to ingest those rosters um, so that they can just give us back where the discrepancies are, and then we can share that back with the with the provider and say, you know, here's your roster that you gave us. Here's where we think you may have some discrepancies based on what we see. So layering that provider point information on top of their roster to give them back that full picture of this is where we see providers who we believe are inactive. These are locations we believe this practitioner is not regularly practicing at and seeing patients at. And we can have a conversation without saying, we don't think your data is accurate. It's very specific and they can actually react to it. And that grid on the side just shows you campaign over campaign, how we've um, increased our response rates. Still would like to get them higher, but um, you know, as you can see, it's a, it's a pretty big swing between um, six and 10. And those campaigns last for 90 days. So you see that's a pretty good lift over time. So one of the efforts we've put in as we talk about practitioners reasonably being at locations, um, we've started a location limit policy. So we are limiting practitioners to only be shown in the directory with five locations per 10 in affiliation. So I think that's a reasonable number of, of locations. It's for the most part um, been very successful, very few exclusions needed, people who feel they need more locations than that. Um, but the, the LexisNexis Risk Solutions data has really been integral to those decisions because as we run reports and see that someone is at, in fact, 10 locations, how do we make that decision to remove five of those locations? Um, so we are using that provider point data to rank those locations, um, you know, taking out the, the reds that are those high risk, taking out those orange coverage locations that were already going to be suppressed, then what are we left with, and then looking at are those rated green or not? Um, so this policy is intended to reduce our not at location errors. I think anyone on the payer side will agree that's our highest um, error category of uh, that any auditor, CMS or otherwise, is looking at is, you know, members feeling like they have been, you know, a little bit duped that they picked a, a health plan or a provider based on their location and then find out they're not actually at the location, at least not able to accept members there. So we want to ensure the practitioners are only displaying where they're actually seeing the members um, and this whole process, as with any other suppression process, removing that from the directory, does not impact claims. It's only for display purposes. Another thing that we do here at Centene is we have an internal call center, and we have that dedicated call center conduct a monthly sample audit to verify that directory facing data. So that's kind of a temperature check with everything that we're doing internally, everything that we partner with LexisNexis on, how are we doing? And we try our best to replicate how CMS would conduct that same audit. So we look at our scoring. We've recently done some realignment with that scoring, um, especially our, our scores on not at location and bad phone are a real focus for our work with LexisNexis and what we're looking for when those audits come back each month to see are we making market improvements there. We've already seen some improvements in the work with LexisNexis. Um, other ways we're trying to leverage that and continue to um, continue to boost those numbers is increase the overall frequency of provider points. We were conducting that sweep of our data quarterly. Now we're doing it monthly. Um, we really do see that that impact so that hopefully if if bad data does sneak its way back in there, at least it's only living there for a month now instead of for a quarter. Um, and we're working on specific phone file exchanges with auto ingestion to really get at that phone number issue and make sure we have the best phone numbers in there as much as possible. Then on uh, some strategy impacts. So as we look at our strategy in 2020 and beyond, um, these are some of the key things that we're working on, again, to improve our accuracy. And all these things are very much in partnership with LexisNexis Risk Solutions. 
Um, I mentioned increasing the frequency of provider point. Um, we're looking at the ability to add facility and hospital data to provider point and, and get that information cleansed as well. Talked about including delegates in VHCP in the attested product um, by using that roster ingestion tool process. Overall, improving our VHCP response rates, continuing to work on mailers and current contacts and anything else we can do to support a better response experience so that we have that data um, in our systems and we are making those updates. Uh, always looking at clearer, more concise reporting, especially for, you know, it's one thing for myself and my team to to understand this and sit and live a good chunk of our lives about it, but as we're handing it down to our health plans, we want to make sure that's very um, ingestible for them so that they can take action on it and don't have to spend a lot of time sifting through reporting, that they can just see very clearly what their action items are and take those. So in the light of that, also increasing automation. My screen didn't like me anymore. Okay. <laughs> uh, one sec. I think I have one more. I'm not sure if you guys are seeing. Okay, here we go. Uh, struggles of the uh, the internet at this point with everyone being remote. Uh, so some other uh, examples of our partnership with LexisNexis. Um, for those external audits, we're using those VHCP, those attested results, as a rebuttal. So if our data is found by an external vendor or sorry, an external auditor to be incorrect, we're looking back at our VHCP attestations to say, okay, we are incorrect, but it's correct based on what we heard from Mary when we called the office two weeks ago. Um, it doesn't make the data right, but it at least shows that we have a reason for doing it. And the key is that hopefully that's a recent attestation, and that's why we need those response rates to be up, so that we can pull up a recent attestation and point to that. Um, Summit attendance. So we have um, LexisNexis Risk Solutions come with us on site for an entire day twice a year. Um, it's a real opportunity for us to be able to share ideas, brainstorm together. It includes all of our health plans so they can all brainstorm and say, you know, what would really help me is if you put this field in this report. And it may not be something that my team would think of, but that LexisNexis team would think of. But for the health plan, it's really going to give them a, a boost and something they're running in their um, reporting. Unfortunately, this. Uh, time around, we were looking to have one in the spring, and that's been canceled with all the travel restrictions, but we're working closely with our LexisNexis partners to figure out if there's any pieces of that we can share in, in individual webinars uh, so we can still share that data and conduct that brainstorming. Then on-site meetings, um, there's many a time when we will pick up the phone and say, hey, we're trying to work through this. Let's all get together in one room at the same time and just crank through this. So a lot of times we've been able to do that and really get to a, a good place and um, be able to get to a resolution. So we always appreciate that partnership. And I'll turn it back over to Shannon to see what we have for questions. Great. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Makisha, both of you, for your wonderful insights this afternoon. Um, we are going to go ahead and open up the Q&A portion of this presentation. As a reminder to everyone, please submit any questions that you may have through the Q&A chat function that's at the bottom of your screen. During um, the presentation, we have had a couple of questions that have come in. So I'm going to go ahead and start with those. And then, um, as I said, if anyone has anything else, please enter them now. So the first question that I'm going to put to, the, um, to Sarah and Makisha. Is there a reliable maintained database of providers and physicians that are part of which medical practices? And which providers or physicians and medical practices are part of which hospital system? Is there anything that is created now that just has that general information? So I think I'll take that there. one first. Oh. <laughs> So I'll start with that one. Um, I mean, I think um, that's what we're we're all trying to strive for is, um, you know, where's the best source of, of reliable data and being able to determine within that who the um, who the right practitioners are to be affiliated with groups. So I think it's a it's a combination. It gets back to the whole silver bullet conversation that um, unfortunately there is no one right place right now. I know CMS is trying to 
um, pull things together to get us there. But right now, I think it's it's got to be a combination of um, provider education, making sure we're asking them to give us updates as soon as they're aware of them, send us rosters, and then also um, folks like LexisNexis that can reach out and attest to that regularly and, and enhance that with additional data they have besides just calling the office and getting that answer. Great. Great. I'd just like to add to that, Sarah, that, that we actually, here at LexisNexis, we actually do, we're working on uh, systems of care uh, products that will be able to provide some of those affiliation uh, information. And uh, I could definitely reach out, Frank, and provide um, a contact that would be able to explain to you what we're working on and uh, see if that's something that you may be interested in learning more about. Great. Nikisha, a question that came in that appears to point to one of your slides. Um, it says, at one point in the presentation, you described several areas that you should address for provider data quality and completeness. Um, you included things like outreach, claims monitoring, um, and each of them had a percentage of improvement beside it. Is the order that you presented those in the order you would suggest that a health plan address, or is that something that's completely customizable? That is something that is completely customizable, and I think it's going to vary per plan, uh, depending on the level of sophistication of their uh, repos data repository, and then their methods of collecting that data also. So it's gonna vary. Okay, thank you. Um, another question that has come in, does the new interoperability legislation impact the accuracy and data consolidation approach? Sarah, I'm going to head that one over to you. <laughs> sure. Um, so we are definitely uh, monitoring that very closely. Um, it, it does appear that that will have an impact. Um, the question is how exactly it's going to be addressed. Um, there's talk of an API of us um, as payers all kind of sending our information in through this API uh, so that we have full transparency. And obviously there's a lot of um, member portions in that as well as far as uh, information sharing. So that's the part that to me is very interesting of how that's all going to work in, in light of PHI and, and HIPAA concerns. But um, I know there's some, definitely some scuttle about that in the, uh, in the governance as that continues to come out and get, and get more fleshed out. So uh, definitely something we're going to have to keep in mind, you know, kind of top of mind for us is always state audits, CMS audits, and now this kind of adds an extra layer in there. So it just ex expresses the importance of us continuing to uh, drive to the most accurate uh, data. Great. Um, we have one final question that's come in. Um, last chance for anybody who's still on the line to put in questions. Um, for either Sarah or Makisha, are there any updates about CMS penalties actually that have been put forth regarding provider directory errors? So this is Sarah, I can take a first stab at that. Um, from, from what we've been told, um, where those CMS audits will be starting up again in the spring. Um, I don't know what COVID-19 effects will have on that, um, if they'll um, want to delay that at all, because I know a lot of offices have, have closed or reduced their hours, and I don't know how successful an outreach would be right now for an audit. Um, but uh, they're looking to, to start that up again. Uh, one thing we, we did hear, too, is that um, they're not requiring the validation of data every 90 days. They're just saying, just get it right. If that means for you, that's every six months, that's every year, great, don't really care. We just want to make sure it's accurate. So it's um, it's interesting, and you don't, kind of don't want to lose the momentum of um, getting that good information back from providers. So that's something to kind of keep in mind. Um, my concern is that when providers hear that, they'll say, well, I don't have to answer your questions right now because you only need it once a year. Um, but you know that goes back to that provider education of um, making sure that we're that we're staying aligned with our providers and that they know how to reach us if they do have a change, no matter how often that is. 
Great. Well, um, I thank you both for all of your insights and for your valuable information today. And thank you to everyone who's still on the line for attending today's session. Um, as we mentioned at the beginning, you will receive a recording of this presentation within 24 hours. Um, so please be on the lookout for that email and recording. And then, yes, we um, will be closing up the question and answer portion at this time. So thank you all for your, appreci uh, for your time. We appreciate your attention, the questions, and hope you all have a great afternoon. Thanks so much.